Ambassador Bankole Adioye is the current and the first commissioner of the combined departments of political affairs and the other department of peace and security into one now called uh, the Department of Political Affairs, Peace and Security in the African Union Commission. And this is after a spectacular performance in the selection process. And also after a spectacular endorsement by the ECOWAS Summit of Heads of States here in Accra, followed by another spectacular endorsement by the AU Executive Council I mean, uh, in terms of uh, the number of votes that he got, which I think is unprecedented from what I uh, recall. Ambassador, I suppose, I'm right, great. So, um, Ambassador, uh, do you prior to becoming uh, the commissioner was uh, the ambassador of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to Ethiopia and uh, with concurrent accreditation to Djibouti. Uh, and also at the same time, permanent representative to the African Union, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, I mean, as well. And during which I had the privilege of getting to know him and uh, getting uh, to fall into coincidence of orientation with him because of his approach and working methods. Uh, he's a great thinker. And uh, as a, but before I come to his thinking, let me also mention that uh, uh, prior to becoming ambassador, I mean, he had also served in various diplomatic missions of Nigeria in Brazil. Uh, in Egypt, uh, the UN, I mean, among uh, others. But as a great thinker, he had his early preparation with a BA in political science and followed by a master's uh, MSc in political science from the University of Lagos, uh, popularly called UNILAC. And uh, subsequently, he became a Chevenin scholar, um, a Commonwealth uh, British Council scholar, um, uh, studying in Oxford University. And I'm gladly informed that our own vice president is also a Chevenin scholar. And uh, welcoming him, he reminded him that he also speaks Yoruba by greeting him in Yoruba. Yes. Uh, Ambassador Dioye also had a defining moment of being seconded to NEPAD secretary and held various positions there. Um, uh, director of corporate affairs, uh, coordinator of strategic partnerships and external relations, and chief of staff of the CEO of NEPAD. Uh, so you, uh, that will show when you uh, hear him um, speak. So um, um, uh, it is my pleasure, therefore, I mean, to present to you um, uh, His, His Excellency Bankole Adioye, who, as I said, is a passionate Pan-Africanist and uh, has a sharp um, uh, thinking capacity, um, contributed to a lot of studies especially when he was at Nepal, the policy papers and uh, different resolutions, I mean, which were passed. And uh, he, in coming to Ghana, accompanied by our own ambassador, Her Excellency, Mrs. Amachum uh, Amwa, and uh, her deputy, Mr. Kwesia Santi, who is shy and is blushing. Uh, but he also has in his own team at the commission, um, Mr. Hassan, who is the point man for West Africa and Ghana. And... Uh, yeah, that's about it. Okay. Uh, that's all. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, 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 Monsieur le Président, uh, Council and audience, your distinguished guest speaker, Ambassador Bankole Adioye, Commissioner Political Affairs, Peace and Security. Thank you. Uh, ambassadors uh, here present, uh, President of the Council, uh, Ambassador Ama. I call him William, I call him Willie. <laughs> and I think he had over embellished the introduction <laughs> with some spectacular things that I don't know of. <laughs> uh, DPR, our colleagues, Excellencies, and those who are joining us uh, online. I think I'm very pleased to be in this uh, particular group uh, because after uh, traversing the world in all our diplomatic career, uh, we have to bring to bear the impact and the experience over, uh, over the years. 
it's also important to see the need for us to bequeath to the youth. And I think this morning I was privileged to address uh, many young diplomats in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration. It is also important to ask the question as to what Africa is looking like, how we were engaged in Africa in the years in service, and what is Africa today. It's also important to point out that the African Union is still a union of governments, not yet a fully-fledged union of people. And for that, particularly in the political governance, peace and security sector, we have huge challenges, as you have stated. But I will not dwell too much because I want to make this a conversation and I will respond to some of the questions. But at no time in the history of the African Union have we had it so bad in terms of the plethora of challenges. The Sahel, as you've stated, is awash with guns and terrorists and insurrectionists including violent extremists and radicals, transnational organized crime, climate change impact, every single point of challenge is actually evident in the Sahel. And as you said, which country is next? And this is why, for us in the African Union, we are monitoring closely and concerned, perturbed sometimes, about the happenings in the Sahel. Libya is also undergoing a transformation, but we hope it's for the better. Elections are due in nine, ten days. Will the elections hold? in Libya, and what is the impact of the Libyan case, Libyan crisis, to the rest of the continent. The same is, is happening in the Horn of Africa. You mentioned the, the conflict in Ethiopia, as well as the long-standing instability in Somalia. Not the talk of South Sudan, that is just reeling from years of civil war. How are we going to handle the situation in Mozambique the first time in East Africa where we have the challenge of terrorism? So the continent, the geography is not looking rosy. The landscape is, is littered with landmines literally, of violence. What I've always referred to as the globalization of violence and the violence of globalization. Indeed, our continent has never in one year since the last two decades had the number of unconstitutional changes of government like we, we, like we have today. So my presentation will be very brief and knowing fully well that all these issues are actually very known to you. How do we respond to these issues? How do we respond to the challenges on our continent? Knowing fully well that we have these problems to deal with and we can make a difference as we go, as we go ahead. I want to assure you that I will not bore you too much <laughs> with these issues. I would rather engage with you, knowing fully well that we can make things happen. Next slide, please. Okay. The end result is the effective governance and peace dividends. 
but we have the tools in various AU instruments. I can tell you they are indeed overwhelming, and I will, I will reel out some of them as we go, as we go ahead. But these tools also make it impossible for us sometimes to interact in a sovereignty-driven, membership, protective environment. Every member state has a right to defend itself and to be defended by its ambassadors or permanent representative. And the collective action becomes sometimes very difficult to approach. Next slide. It is important to emphasize that as we go ahead, maybe I will, I will stand and move closer to the presentation and to make it lively. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Our mandate is very clear, as Ambassador Williams stated. We have had to start looking at what the new department, newly merged from political affairs, separate before, with peace and security. It's the first time, but it is also a heavy portfolio. We have the issues that relate to election observation, election monitoring, promotion of democracy, working with the APRM, working with civil society to make it happen. We are at the same time trying to build peace and make peace. And then, as you said, enforce peace. And I will go back to the question later on. We have all the necessary instruments. Next slide. To move ahead, knowing that our end goal is all around the Agenda 2063. Very, very lofty aspirations. But will we, are we going to be able to realize these goals and actualize them as soon as practicable? The goal of Africa that is of good governance, that respects human rights, that respects justice and the rule of law, that promotes the, the, the interest of, the, of women and the youth. And of course, a peaceful and secure Africa. And I can tell you that we still have almost 40 something years to go, but we have a huge task ahead of us. Next time. These are the functions of our new department, the full cycle of conflict prevention, which is very critical, but as you know, as diplomats, is the most difficult thing to, 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 to achieve because everybody denies that there is a conflict in their bloomy, brewing in their countries. Issues of conflict management, and of course, the resolution, the post-conflict context, making sure that we build the synergy and the coalition, uh, coordination, as well as making sure that we strengthen the roles of equity and working to the next level, which we'll see. So departmentally, we are, we are well established, but we, we, know, we don't really have the staff at this stage because with the institutional uh, reform under President Paul Kagame of Rwanda is taking its time in time to ensure we have merit-based recruitment processes. Next slide. Now, this, these are the challenges I was saying. And you, once you see Sahel, you see most of this. You see the Lake Chad, you see most of this. You see the Horn of Africa, you see these threats. Climate change impact is obvious. Heather, farmer conflicts, clashes all over. You see money laundering and transnational organized crime. Africa is facing its own challenges like none ever before. And we have to really work hard to promote better governance. Next slide. 
So what is Africa Union doing? What are we doing in this department to address this emerging peace and security threats? That question is also for all of us. And what should we do better? We're just returning from the Center for Democratic Development, CDD Ghana. And I asked the array of professors, what solutions do they have? So I'm going to ask you, the array of <laughs> distinguished ambassadors with decades of experience, also, what solutions we have to address these threats that are persistent and real. It is for this reason I came up with my own immediate response. On coming into office, first 100 days, first one year, I felt that we had to do some necessary things, including improving what we had. So I designed this very, the five strategic pillars, making sure that the first model is to re-energize the early warning and prevent conflict and then be ready for mediation. I cannot tell you in nine months, exactly today is the ninth month in office. This is the most difficult task because our early warning is not respected by many member states. A young man here is an expert in early warning and he will tell you his experience, knowing fully well that, of course, we saw Sudan on the wall. We saw the writing on the wall. We did not see Guinea the way it turned out, but we saw it that it was in crisis, and we left it off our radar. We saw Mali on the wall. But what else can we do as intergovernmental body? Uh, this is the number one pillar that we have tried to, to put together. The second one is that we've, already, we've always relied on the UN and the partners and the EU to build a capacity. What else can we do to build an integrated capacity to fight to, to, to actually better manage conflicts, particularly conflicts arising from terrorism and violent extremism. This is our second priority. And then, of course, they are not in any way in ascending or descending order. They are all interwoven. How do we strengthen democracy? That's what we are saying today at CDD. How can all of us as Africans rally together and promote this democracy and make it good governance at the end of the day. And then we have to build inclusive partnerships for human security. And that partnership is not between governments alone. And that is why I'm privileged to be addressing you today as, mem as partners for the fi to finding the solutions to these numerous challenges. And finally, the coordination and implementation that we need in terms of particularly of the new structure that, would, that was shared with us earlier. Next slide. And this, this uh, move on, they are, we're just uh, elaborating. Next slide. So this shows what we are speaking all about. The African Standby Force, you may recall, has been on their calendar since the days of the African of the Organization of African Union or Unity, OAU. It is still we are battling to make it fully operationalized. Only SADC has deployed in the name of the standby force two times. One preventive mission in Lesotho and the current mission to Mozambique. ECOWAS has deployed, but does not call it African Standby Force. They deployed in Cote d'Ivoire and they've deployed also in Gambia. And of course, ECOMOG, as we speak, is still part of Gambia and Guinea-Bissau. So we need this capacity. It needs a huge sum of money. But we will need to put our own resources in time. And later on, as I respond to the mechanisms, you will see the issues ahead. Next slide. African strengthening democracy is, uh, is in a natural talk. 
And this is why we believe very strongly in the synergy we are building with what we call the African governance architecture and the African peace and security architecture. That because of the merger of the two departments, political governance and addressing peace and security will only come naturally when our democracy is in a better state and good governance becomes part of our daily lives on the continent. So we're on the road towards getting that happen. And I spoke to you about the partnerships and about how smart it should be, the networking. We are creating a network of think tanks, a network of uh, civil society for peace. We have, we have created young ambassadors, uh, African youth ambassadors, and we hope that all of them will be dialogue-centered. That's why we are having this dialogue today. Next slide. Next slide. We are working with the Rex to make this happen. Now, what do we have in our response kit, Excellencies? We have a number of any protocol that is worth its salt. And you will see them, the silencing the guns, you mentioned them. You, we have the special representatives of the chairperson in most of the troubled conflict reading countries. We have the Peace and Security Council that was established by our leaders, which we never had before in the OEU days. So we have our own UN Security Council at our doorstep. And I'm pleased to announce that Ambassador Ama will be chair of that council in June, in January 2022. Next slide. We have created the, an amnesty month where all guns, illegal guns, are supposed to be returned. By every September, it becomes very mandatory for us to push this agenda. We observe elections. This year alone, 15 countries have, have held elections. And the AU have observed at least 13 of them. Directly, parliamentary, presidential, just like we just finished in Gambia. And of course, we have started the post-conflict reconstruction awareness week. Next slide. We have the panel of the wise. We'll be pleased to have some of you in the panel. And I'm sure Ambassador Ama will start working towards that because we need the experience, the lessons learned to be part of what uh, we can do together. We have a special envoy on women, peace, and security in furtherance of the UN, UN Security Council Resolution 1325, which is two decades old. We, we are going to set up wise youth mechanism because we have the female one, which is called FemWise. We believe once we set up the women, youth, and uh, all these mechanisms, our th thematic approach to these issues will be better off. We have a framework for the youth as well. We have every response, potential response mechanism that is needed. Next slide. We have the Peace Fund. We are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are operating for peace in four or five countries, or five regions. I'm in some in Somalia, MNJTF in Lake Chad Basin, G5 Sahel, Samim, like I told you, in Mozambique, and the Observer Mission in Central African Republic. But are they effective? Have we been able to address and reduce or eliminate or resolve these conflicts? I will leave that answer to you. We have the Charter on Maritime Security, border program, charters of everyone. We're setting up an interregional economic community knowledge exchange on early warning and conflict prevention. Please, next slide. So I will not go to all this. Yeah. But these are the challenges we face. So far, with three countries this year, 15 of our member states have once have been indeed suspended from the African Union for unconstitutionally changing their governments. There is no other intergovernmental body that does that. It's only the African Union. We have the Lome Convention and we have all the necessary tools. So we, in response to the challenges, this year alone, Sudan has been suspended. Mali has been suspended. 
Guinea is also on suspension as we speak. And Chad is on the watch list. We are monitoring the development in Chad and we have not suspended Chad. And, but at the same time, we are working to make sure that political transition is smooth and is peaceful. Next slide. So these are the concepts that we have, we have developed by the developed by our leaders on all the issues relating to democracy. Next slide. I will leave these uh, presentations with you. Next slide. So we have all these the toolboxes full, but the implementation is the challenge. Next slide. Next slide. So what can we do to move forward? How can we address these issues? And I will speak to some of them also make sure that outside the box. The first is that the challenge we face today, Excellencies, President of the Council, is not the challenge we faced 30 years ago. So some of these tools have to be remodeled and re-engineered, like we were told today in the engagement with CDD. It is obvious that some of them are not working. It is obvious that our response mechanisms need to be energized. It is obvious that the Peace and Security Council, as an organ, decision-making on peace and security, will need to also actively implement his role, live by his role every day. It is important that we see that constitutionalism remains the bedrock. Ghana is a shining example, two, three times of political transition, successful. Can we have that in many of our countries? This year, out of those elections that have been held, at least only three have had successful political transition from the opposition winning the incumbent. In Zambia, in Sao Tome, and in Cape Verde. So we have the record to do that. But next slide. I will leave you with the the question asked by the president of the council. We, we try to make peace. We try to build peace. But can we enforce peace? Because there is no peace to keep with Boko Haram or ISIS or this Al-Shabaab in Mozambique or in Somalia or the radicals in the Sahel. We therefore have to build that capacity. We need to make a change and make peace enforcement our strategic goal. We are, we, are, we are working very closely with the United Nations, knowing fully well by the Charter, they, only, they can only do peacekeeping. And peacekeeping is not combat. But what we are facing in the Sahel is combat. What we face in, the, in Libya is combat. What we are facing in the Lake Chad is combat. What we are facing in Mozambique is combat. Meaning that the UN is becoming irrelevant for the Africa today. And that's why we have to build our own force. We have to make sure that peace enforcement becomes the centerpiece of our international, of our collective continental action. But one important factor, Excellencies, is that we don't have the resources. The United Nations mission in South Sudan budget is $1 billion a year. The United Nations support to the mission in Somalia is $700 million a year. We cannot afford this financially. But as members, 54 of our 55 members I'm also member states of the United Nations. We are demanding it as a right to, to be guaranteed access to the assessed contributions of the United Nations. That for this, you need to support AU-led peace support operations in Somalia, in the Sahel, in the MNJTF, in Central African Republic, in Mozambique, 
and the rest. It is important for us that we change our concept of peacekeeping. The Kofi Annan in, uh, Peacekeeping International Center is a center of excellence around the world. And there is no month that one of our officers is not here on training. But the concept, a paradigm shift, a paradigm shift is needed. Because peacekeeping cannot hold in the Sahel. It cannot hold in Lake Chad. It cannot hold in those countries. And that is why the Dakar International Forum for Peace and Security is very critical. And that is why we have been engaging with the UN to change its perception about Africa. And we are putting in place all the necessary compliance frameworks to be able to qualify, in quote, for the resources of the United Nations. And I want to assure you that UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres is 100% supportive of this. He told us the UN cannot do this job. It is only the African Union and its member states. Our regional economic communities must come together and we are mobilizing the resources. One of the response mechanisms we have is the African Union Peace Fund. The Peace Fund was created in 1993 and the highest amount it ever reached was $11 million. Today, the Peace Fund has been revitalized. And we have today $240 million in the account. And we have never spent a dollar because we have put in place governance structures that have been very, very robust. Indeed, I say the fund is overgoverned. To, to spend a dollar from the fund for accountability purposes, you have to go through the Peace and Security Council, to the Executive Management Committee, to the Board of Trustees, and then to the ambassadors in the Permanent Representatives Committee. By that time, thousands of people, and if not millions, their lives will be at risk. So we're looking at the, the pilot scheme in 2022 to start using the fund on a very small scale to support cross-country projects that will address and show that Africa has put its mouth, put its money where its mouth is. Because we need our own resources. We cannot always count on the UN, but we don't have the array of the resources. But with the, 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 the fund is targeting $400 million endowment fund. But before we reach that target, we'll be using it and be replenish the fund under the leadership of the chairperson of the commission, Mustafa K. Muhammad. What I want to conclude with is that we need your support all along as members of the diplomatic corps in your career, you, you know where the shoe pinches. But the shoe is really getting a lot of knocks these days because all the mechanisms we have, our response efforts must never be in vain. We have young men and women fighting for a stable Somalia. We have four countries plus Benin fighting Boko Haram and its other armed groups in the Lake Chad Basin. S Southern Africa has put its young men and women on the line in Mozambique. The G5 Sahel, we have undertaken a joint assessment with the UN to see how best we can fully resource human, technical, financial, and make Sahel the history, the historic part of Africa, which used to be producing the Mansa Musas and the great Timbuktu Center. That is the Africa we know. But today, because of the globalization of violence and the violence occasioned by globalization, you can, in your, in your cell phone, produce an IECD. All you need to do is buy the local materials. And you can, you can be taught how to make guns, how to make uh, bombs and weapons and use it online. Social media has become a source of hate. These are challenges that we, as younger men and women, never experienced. Meaning that these mechanisms that I've, I've uh, relayed to you 
are definitely need to be sharpened and taken back to the drawing board. And this is why we need your support. But I want to assure you that we will not rest until we defeat terrorism and violent extremism because it is on Africa. Africa is a peaceful, loving country. We are a gift to the world in culture, in music, and in everything that we can think of. This is not the Africa that we want. The Africa we want is a peaceful, more secure, and of course, more democratic Africa. I thank you very much for having me. Um, we are very comforted by the brilliant presentation made by the commissioner. I want to assure the commissioner that you do have our support. And in fact, in, that is basically what the Council on Foreign Relations was set up for, to support institutions like yours to be able to deliver. So you, in fact, going forward, we're planning to be actively engaged with the union, which, which started the discussions and to play a very active role in any endeavor which aims at bringing peace and stability. I forgot at the beginning to introduce two of our executive members who are with us. Ambassador Tinkran is uh, our Secretary General. He served in Japan before then. Uh, he, he was ambassador to Japan and before then he was High Commissioner to Nairobi. <laughs> and Ethiopia. He served in Addis. Lawyer Agbozo uh, works with an international mining organization. He's one of our most active members. So that we thought we should take the opportunity for him to meet you. We, we didn't want a lot of the executive members to come and harass you because of COVID reasons. So they, they, they're all watching you from their various uh, homes. I want to thank you very, very much for your presentation. I'm sure that there are many participants who are itching to ask specific questions. So if we can have an indication as to who would like to take the floor first in asking questions. I thought that I saw Dr. Ken Ahosu Dr. Hosu, if you are with us, would you like to ask your question? Uh, uh, do I have a question? I'm kind of actually lost. Um, <laughs> my um, question is, how do we get here? Um, and it is only right and proper uh, that Ambassador, Mr. Speaker, said um the AU is trying to own the process of what uh, uh peacemaking in Africa uh because there are so many questions had the intervention not gone on um in Libya would we have been in the mess that we are and the western world their suggestion was that fighting Militancy is largely fighting through the military. Well, we have seen the example from uh, Afghanistan, where the biggest bomb in the world was dropped there. But eventually, they have parted away. Uh, this is where my concern is for the AU. Um, they have so many tools that they are trying to use, uh, particularly early warning and preventive distance, which I believe will be the more effective. Uh, but should we assume the military stance, thinking that having resources or troops to fight will win us this battle, then we'll be falling in the same pitfall as the Western world has been in a number of places. Um, my main concern is that I will not call myself an elite, uh, but uh, we have failed Africans. 
as uh, Basil Davidson made the point, the ordinary African is not about flag, is not concerned with flags, is not concerned with what? Coat of arms. What they are concerned about is food on the table, roof over the head. And I think this is where leadership governments have failed Africans. And today, they being victim are being seen as villains who are being regarded as what militants. So, um, and I would also make the point that democracy as we are talking about today is becoming part and parcel of the problem. Uh, whereby the ordinary Africans' views are not taken into consideration. Um, as I said, I don't really have a question, but what I want to say is that the most important thing that we have to do in order to remedy all these problems is to dialogue with the ordinary Africans try as much as possible to listen to them. That's the only thing I can say to this August meeting because uh, working with the grassroots as far as conflict is concerned, sometimes things that look so difficult when you meet people one-on-one -on -one and respect them and listen to them, just after talking to them, the problem is solved. So this is what I think we have to do. AU should call upon the various governments in the Sahel and wherever conflict is, as to what? Demand from the high pedestal of government and dialogue with their people and find a common solution. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Osu, thank you very much. You're speaking like, a, a, as usual, a conflict uh, specialist. I think that was really a, a comment. So we'll take another two comments or questions before I hand over to the distinguished speaker. A uh, friend from the UNECA, Atamensa, are you with us? Yes, sir. I am here. Please go, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Always great to be here. And uh, um, to my good brother and uh, a friend, uh, Ambassador Bankele, uh, it's, it's great that you are going back home because I know that you just have an address in Nigeria, but your real home is where you are sitting now. So it's good. I'm sorry that I'm not there with you. I'm sorry. Um, um, and I want to recognize my ambassador. Otherwise, she will not let me get back to Addis, uh, Ambassador Ama uh, uh, Um I just want to, if, you, you, if I may, um, you know, Ambassador, I'm so, uh, Ambassador Bankole, I'm so happy uh, about what you said about the peace fund. And you do know that um, uh, we started working on this peace fund with uh, Dr. Kabaruka. Uh, and uh, at the time, the last time I checked the numbers, it was 140 million. And now, as you said, it's 240, which is great. Uh, I'm also happy that, you know, the mechanism in place, and this to your audience, the audience should know, is that it's, it's being funded by Africans. You know, this is something which uh, we don't talk. We think that every time we go with a bowl outside to beg, but this is something which is funded by member states. And I just wish that they would continue to do so more. The other thing which you do, you do know very well, that and, uh, uh, the financing of the African Union itself, the African Union Commission, not the union, the commission, it's a challenge. Um, and uh, we have three categories of budget. One is for the operations, which is the paying for the uh, electricity and the staff of the African Union Commission. And one is for programs. And you do know very well that when we were looking at the financing, we said uh, member states agreed that they would cover 100% of the operations. Um, They'll cover 75% of programs and 25% uh, of peace operations because the decision to put those weights is that Peace operations are something which are global and uh, it's something that is not only African, but most of it happened, there. that's why the 25%. And the last time I checked, we were finding, before COVID, we were finding about 40% uh, of the programs. I don't know where we are on that, but 100% we are doing. And one of the mechanisms that we worked on was to have the 0.2% levy uh, of imports that are coming into the country, uh, coming into Africa. 
And we calculated, our calculations is that it could, if everybody embarked on it, it could self-finance the African Union and even would change, which could go into peace operations, uh, as you said. But unfortunately, um, African member states are not are very reluctant to make that contribution of 0.2% because they always say they don't have the money. And this is a mechanism which is like a tax. It's not like the Ophiria test tax, please, uh, since uh, Ghana is not talking about the tra- uh, financial taxes. But this is something which we, we were aimed. So I'm just hoping, and I want to applaud Ghana for being a champion and being one of the earliest people, uh, earliest countries which embarked on. The last time I checked, it was about maybe 12 countries that are or 14 countries, and some are in the process. But I think if this is something, uh, Ambassador, I would, I would want you to champion that that we can become self-financed at the African Union Commission will be self-financed if can member states agree to the levy of the 0.2% on export uh, imports, sorry, imports come in. And if we go further with a 0.2, maybe later on, because Amazon, uh, which is in Somalia, and uh, you talked about the Sahel, and all this is costing money. Um, and we have to find a way of paying for our own uh, uh, challenges, and we cannot continue to mortgage uh, uh, to the rest of the of, of the world. So I would want you to perhaps maybe talk a little bit more about that. Uh, I'll be quick because I know others would want to also come in on the transformation uh, of the African Union led by uh, um, um, President uh, Paul Kagame. Um, you do know that uh, we used to have the political uh, affairs department, and then we had the peace security, peace and security department. Now we've me- merged the two. I just want you to uh, uh, um, 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 comment or maybe how it's working, because uh, some of us uh, were of the opinion that that's what is that's what is supposed to be do- done, because peace is, as Kofi Annan said, there's no peace if there's no development, and there's no development if there's no peace. So therefore, most of the political uh, affairs uh, issues are intertwined with peace and security. And so it is right that we have one commissioner under it, and I hope that you can comment on that. Most people sitting there, uh, 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 Ambassador Bankole, is Ethiopia is on their mind. Ethiopia is on their mind. And uh, we applaud the work that uh, uh, President Obasanjo is doing. Could you share a little bit more light on that as to how the uh, uh, affairs are, are going in that country and uh, uh, whether peace is durable. I read in this uh, the New York Times uh, uh, today that they, are, they now had commented and said that the strike was, uh, uh, first strike came from the Tigray. Um, and they now admit that the tide has turned against uh, 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 the Tigray and the uh, 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 the Ethiopian Defense Force now have the upper hand, but although the, the so for me it seems to me that the narrative is shifting, and it's shifting towards a democratically elected government, uh, which is being pursued by um, a, a minority. And uh, I only want your take uh, because some people in the Western press feel that the uh, AU is more sympathetic to um, uh, Pr- uh, Prime Minister Abiy. Uh, and it has to do more. I don't know what, what you think. But uh, thank you so, so much uh, for, for being. And if you have time, you can comment on the UN-AU uh, relationship. And uh, let me tell you that your, your boys are here in the house with you. Uh, uh, Adeyemi uh, uh, Yinka is here. And uh, uh, Bumi Manuka Makinoa is also in the house online with you. So you have full support here. And I thank you. I'm sorry. I apologize that I've been too... Uh, 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 um, long, but you know that I'm very passionate about AU matters, and I'm passionate. And uh, just like you, you've done so well. You are you've been a, an international civil servant. You never uh, attempted to go into the private sector to look for money. Uh, you've always served. You served with distinguished uh, distinction. Uh, your country, and then with the NEPAD, and also now in your commission. And I have no doubt that the uh, AU commission is really, really. Uh, uh, it's been served well by having you uh, there as a commissioner for peace and security and political affairs. I thank you, sir. Mr. Tobin, sir, thank you very much. Uh, we are pleased with your passion because to, for Pan-Africanism to produce the results that we want, passion 
is required. We'll take one more question or comment before I hand over to the distinguished speaker. Do I have Abdul Mar Malik Gariba? Yes, sir, Echi. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Echi, for this unique opportunity. Uh, first of all, I also want to extend uh, my gratitude to the presenter, Excellency Bankoli, for such an insightful presentation. Echi, this is a question. It may not necessarily go to the speaker, but probably to the think tank. I, may rec I can recall vividly during the maiden inaugural speech, His Excellency Dr. Marvin Chambers spoke on security and in try, he made a, a, a recommendation that the private sector can also be roped in to try to see how they can raise funds to support the peace and security initiatives that are going on in the continent. I just wanted to know from the Foreign Service Council, how far has this recommendation been? And what strategies are being taken to see to it that the private sector or system or framework is fashioned so that the private sector can also contribute? But if there's no security, there's no room for business. So in that context, I think the think tank needs to take it up. Thank you, Your Excellency. Yes, Iji, would you like to take the floor? Yes. Well, thank you very much uh, for, for the comments and the questions. And I will try to respond. Uh, the idea is that we make this very conversational, very interactive. And I'm pleased that uh, the few slides that I produced generated this interest. And the first question, how did we get here? Really, it's obvious. Absolute developmental neglect. You will notice the northeast of Nigeria, where Boko Haram used to thrive, is one of the poorest parts of Nigeria, if not the poorest. The Cabo Delgado province in Mozambique is the poorest part of Mozambique. The question of Somalia have been with us since the 1990s. It was a question of poor governance. And of course, Sahel today is awash with terrorists, mainly because of neglect by the various governments and past governments in the country. It is therefore obvious that what we need to do more is to address these root causes, these structural drivers. But let's not fool ourselves. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take decades to fix. And that is why the question is the military response that you see from the African Union, from the international community, from the superpowers, is not directly 100% military. It is what we call a multidimensional stabilization mission in most of them. You have the Amazon in Somalia and has been there for 14 years, but it has a huge police component. And we are grateful to the government of the Republic of, Gam of Ghana as one of those providing the police contingent in Somalia. So we are looking at a multi-dimensional, multi-approach to the challenges facing our countries in terms of terrorism. We have engaged with the standby force for, for, for SADC in, in Mozambique, and we are providing experts in women, peace and security matters, in child protection, in climate security to the mission. So no mission is 100% combat in the AU doctrine for peace support operations. However, the leading component is always the military. But it is the retraining, and that's why I mentioned the Kofi Annan 
Peacekeeping International Center for, it, for the good work it's doing in trying to train every African possible to make sure that this multidimensional approach is, is important. It is important to also emphasize that why African leadership and ownership more or less has increased in terms of addressing peace and security. As my friend Atta Mensa said, we will get there in the long run, knowing fully well that it takes us time to entrench democracy on the continent. But we have to realize that globalization has helped the terrorists copy and paste their, their tactics. From 9-11 to date, the difference is very clear. We have had more attacks. The African Union has a center for the study and research of terrorism based in Algiers. This time last year, we've had only 800 attacks. This year, Africa has witnessed over 960 attacks. So this phenomenon is going up. And the only way we can stop it at this time is that multidimensional approach that takes care of military, the police, law enforcement, and the civilian component with expertise dealing with elections, with prolica transition, with uh, providing at the same time quick impact projects, water sanitation for communities that have been overrun and even converted to radical ideology. I was in Difa in Niger Republic as Nigerian ambassador three, four years ago. And in all the community, you will see old women and children. All the men are with Boko Haram. By force, comp compulsion. This is what we face. And this is why we have to also fight this war in terms of combating and countering the ideology of hate. And that ideology is what we can use using the media to appeal to our citizens to make changes happen. So I fully agree with you that we need the broad-based dialogue, not only, not only as elite, as you said, but with all strata of the society. And this is why we are engaging the council today. We are engaging the civil society. And I did, I'm not, I did not come to Ghana alone to meet only this government official. We are meeting the representatives of the Ghanaian society. And I think this is what that dialogue will continually do with the level of the community, to the local level, and make things happen. Let me, let, let me, let me thank my friend Atamensa for... His salient points, uh, he knows the African Union more than me. <laughs> and I want to assure him that uh, what he has said is factual. A few months ago, late last year, we were still at about 150, 140 million in the AU Peace Fund. This fund is very, very strategic because the little things we can do with our resources will show African solidarity an African response to some of these issues. And we are using that as a really litmus test for the eventual sustainable, adequate, and predictable funding for all our peace support missions. And you will see that in our, in, in our lexicon in the AU, we do not use peacekeeping because there's no way the AU is doing peacekeeping. We use peace support operations. And I'm also happy that the UN has started using peace operations instead of peacekeeping per se. The Undersecretary General in charge of peacekeeping is now called, simply called peace operations. And they've also moved prevention to political affairs, just we are, like we have done. So internationally, we are, we are recalibrating recalibra our views and our thoughts and our concepts to make things far better. It is important that you mentioned the, 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 the programmatic support by member states. 
These are the things we are dealing with. But at the level of the peace and security, we are still far behind. We are not yet reached 10% of the 20, 25% target. Our budget is still solely determined by the European Union and many bilateral partners who see the need to support Africa, but at the same time, sometimes have their own national agenda. So we have to strike a balance. And that's why we've talked about inclusive and smart partnership. And I think it was uh, Abdul Malik Gaba who mentioned the private sector. We need to bring the Dangotes and the, and the private sector leaders to the table. It is expected for them to contribute to the peace fund. At this stage, the peace fund, as you said, is 100% member state. And every country has contributed to the fund in the last three, four years, including Ghana. Only one country, which is Tunisia, has never contributed a dollar to the fund. And we want to make sure that we encourage Tunisia to join the fray and make sure that we all are on the same track. The 0 0.2 levy, as you said, a few countries, it was, it was acceptable to many member states that it should be a two-track approach. Those who can do it and those who can continue as long as they pay their assessed contributions on time. The budget of the AU totally is less than $300 million. That would not even serve half of the needs of South Sudan. When you compare to the needs of humanita humanitarian relief, materials, and all what you need. But I'm very convinced, and I've told Yinka and uh, those who are uh, in the ECA with you, and uh, Makinwa, your, our friends who are there, assuring you that we are going to start working in the new year on the next doors of peace, security, and development. Like you said, Kofi Annan said, there can be no peace without development and no, no development without peace. That is why we need the support of the United Nations. And we see the United Nations as ours. Every member state except one is a member of the United Nations. And that, is, that means we are also part of the United Nations. And we are ready to work with you, knowing fully well that this newly merged department, I can tell you, is, is awesome in terms of work. It's huge. It takes a lot of courage to even sometimes I, I, I ask myself, why did I get into this job? <laughs> but I must say that is exciting and it would have been totally hollow and shallow if we did not match these two departments because the challenges today are basically arising from political governance. And that is why I talk of the mainstreaming of African governance architecture into its peace and security counterpart. That is the only way we can make an impact addressing the root causes, the, net, the, 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 the ground level of governance, improving the livelihoods of our people and their lives, and making sure that we have better effective governance in the long term. You mentioned your home. I hope uh, we will continue to see you in Addis. Let me assure you that it is a very, very painful exercise for Africa to revert back to on the path of civil war. And you know that the climate, the landscape of conflicts in Africa has changed from the days where we had inter and intrastate war to now war or conflict with ununiformed armed groups who blend with the society and is very difficult to approach. So the, 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 the crisis the conflict in Ethiopia is very concerning for us. It is indeed perturbing. But what we are sure of is that we continually engage. What is not in the news is that in my nine months in office today, I have met the foreign minister of Ethiopia and deputy prime minister Demeke Makanen six times. I still met him a week ago. And the only message is threefold. Declare an unconditional, comprehensive, inclusive ceasefire. 
because you cannot win this war by military means. The two sides will not have a military victory. And you know, as a Nigerian that we witnessed the civil war, I was growing up as a youngster during the civil war in, Le in, in the East, grow growing up in Lagos, we saw the horrors, the horrors of war as a youngster. And I told them, I told our Ethiopian friends that in any civil war, there is no victor and there is no vanquished. The civil war will always have losers on both sides. And history has shown that civil wars are more painful and more destructive. And this is why we have continuously called the African Union has no interest except peace in its headquartered country. It is obvious that a, a lot of observers have misread our emphasis on quiet diplomacy and shuttle diplomacy. It took us time, it took us months to reach the compromise with all the eight, seven, eight countries of the Horn of Africa based on our determination by IGAD. And we had to realize that the necessity is for peace to reign. And that ceasefire is what we have continually called for. The second point we've always raised is humanitarian access based on the obligations of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia on all the instruments international on humanitarian access. This is not negotiable. And we are pleased that in the last few weeks, the government of Ethiopia has been doing a lot to improve on access to the troubled region of Tigray. It is also important to emphasize that the last point that we have made, and these three points are also made by the High Representative for the Horn President, former President Olusegun Gombasite of Nigeria, that political solution is the only way out, which must be anchored on mediation and dialogue, as well as national reconciliation. So we are doing our best because it's home to us. As I speak, my spouse is in Addis Ababa. Some of us have our children in Addis Ababa. We do not want Addis Ababa to go up in, the flame, in flames, or we do not want street to street, house to house fighting, because it will be bloody. And that is why we are pleading and appealing to the, to the two sides through the high representative who is going to be in Addis Ababa next week again that peace is the way out and ceasefire will not hurt any of our member states. I really want to thank you again. The peace is doable in, in, in Ethiopia. It may look forlorn in the Sahel, but it's realistic. Indeed, Somalia with 14, 15 years of war, peace is always achievable. Let me thank you, Excellencies, again for having me. And I really want to appreciate this time, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Malik, you asked a very specific question to the council. You were referring to the recommendation made by uh, Dr. Mohamed Ibn Chambas about what the council needed to do about uh, private sector involvement in uh, resource mobilization to, for, for peace and stability. Um, in fact, in, in, our inaugural in his inaugural speech, the president of Ghana made a similar recommendation. And so you would have noticed that in our second batch of admissions to the council, a lot of them were from the private sector. And since the private sector people joined us as a council, we have engaged them very actively. In fact, the lady who just walked in, who was the lawyer, to the Council on Foreign Relations Ghana is the one who has been engaging particularly with some of our uh, private sector players, including uh, the GMPC. So uh, Malik, we, we are quietly working with the private sector. You remember that we had a conference which, for which we had the, the lead contributors, one of them from the private sector, uh, the managing director of Delex Finance. I think that was the platform he shared with Ambassador Winado Kanyirige, William, not so. 
So Malik, we we're quietly trying to see what the private sector can do. Do we have any further comments or questions? If we do not, then let me, on behalf of the Council on Foreign Relations Ghana, thank His Excellency for such a brilliant presentation. We are comforted by the fact that you are completely on top of the subject. Because in all these matters, if you do not understand the dynamics of it and the processes that can lead to solutions, then we have a problem. And in Africa, over, over the years, we've had the misfortune of appointing the wrong people to such important and key jobs. Because if, if we, we don't get people like you who understand the issues, who are committed to it, then you know there'll be no solutions. I would like to thank you very much. We're comforted in the knowledge that we have a partner that we can work with. We're encouraged by the fact that uh, you are engaging not only uh, the elites or the governments, but you're dealing with women's groups, civil servants, civil society organizations, and the youth. Even in your presentation, I noticed that you were you're setting up other bodies who can all contribute to the uh, resolution of some of these threats. Indeed, Excellency, we, we, we are not in a very good position in Africa. And I'm glad that you started by admitting that perhaps Africa had never found itself in such dire straits. So this calls for urgent action. And I'm so glad that you, 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 you demonstrate your commitment to quick, speedy, but well thought through action. We're most, we're most grateful to you. And we want to once again assure you that our council will work closely with the commission and very actively to see what role we can play uh, in attempting to find solutions to all these emerging trends. Once again, thank you very much, Your Excellency. And thank all of you for participating in our conference today. We will announce the next conference uh, by email in the coming week. Thank you and have a good evening.